thanks. Um, I'm Abby Potter. I'm um, with the Library of Congress Labs uh, team, which is in um, the Digital Strategy Directorate, which is part of the Office of the Chief Information Officer, which is the sort of central IT unit in at the Library of Congress. Um, just a little bit of context of where it might help it, uh, sort of understand where we're coming from. We have a um, a experiment process, a exper experimentation process uh, that is sort of uh, represented here in the middle um, picture here. Um, it's uh, we do a lot of different kinds of experiments. We do um, uh, we work with contractors, we work with partners, we work with um, we do events and workshops. Uh, but um, the general process, the general goal is to sort is to learn about things before investing or implementing it. Um, and we. Uh, are guided by our digital strategy and the goals that are set there. So that's um, uh, how we're sort of oriented. Um, and our experiments are designed to be limited in time and scope um, and uh, uh, deliver different results than a production level system. So we don't have any permanent programs. Our plan is to always um, sort of do experimentation on behalf of, of the library and then um, uh, uh, sort of hand it off, hand off. If, if a program emerges, then it it, um, it it would be handed off to another part of the library for sort of uh, to run at a, in a permanent state. Um, the uh, and AI and ML sort of bubbled up pretty quickly on our on our sort of radar. Um, it's it, it's uh, called out in our digital strategy, not in a very specific way, but um, uh, the. Um, when we released the digital strategy, we we also released our um, our API, and um, we were doing a lot of experiments on computational use of collections, and um, found a, we're finding a lot that um, enhancing metadata um, and enhancing description of our digital collections would sort of serve different uses of them. So this is um, why we started experimenting in machine learning, and there are a couple of other. Um, uh, sort of drivers. Um, first, um, the the volume of digital materials. So um, we recently published a digital collection strategy, and that's going to trigger the growth of our digital content in a really exponential way. Um, so we have some scale issues that we have to consider. Um, also, we are all really feeling the imperative to be user centered. So um, in, ad in addition to the increased volume of, of content, um, the expectations from our users are growing, and um, we really want to remain relevant to their needs and and um, and enhance our digital services. Uh, another one is um, that the AI technologies are becoming more and more mature. There's a lot of open source models and commercial services that are really widely available, and um, the field of data science and and com the computer science and AI are producing a lot of students and a lot of research and a lot of jobs. Um, there's also right now. Uh, a lot of enterprise-wide sort of next generation systems that are currently being planned and built at the library. And we're starting to integrate um, cloud infrastructure. So decisions on how um, the data and the business needs will sort of link up and link these systems together are gonna have really lasting consequences. So we're trying to focus there. And then fifth, um, uh, the other sort of driver that makes us very ripe for experimentation is because there's a lot of unknown risks in deploying AI systems at scale. Um, looking around doesn't seem like folks are really at that place yet in libraries. So there's a lot of performance or accuracy risks that you know, we uncover in our experiments, a lot of business risks um, uh, you know, if, if in, in building new systems and how they sort of talk to each other and manage data. And then risks that would perpetu perpetuate entrenched biases. And there's also cost risks. A lot of these are, systems are very expensive. So, um, this is why we're really uh, uh, looking at um, uh, machine learning AI as a, as a core part of our experimentation. Um, so we've done a lot of, we've done since about 2019, we've been um, uh, exploring the different methods and models that um, we could use in, at the library. And um, we've also been collaborating with technical and curatorial and reference staff and especially ex external partners and vendors um, and we've learned a lot of different things. We've, um, in, uh, from our collaboration with the University of Nebraska Lincoln's Project Ada team, we learned that ML and deep learning could really help us classify and segment and sort documents in a workflow. Um, we tested 
uh, humans in the loop workflow to um, combine crowdsourcing and machine learning um, to identify business names in, in places and digitize telephone directories. And we also research users' reactions to being presented with crowdsourcing tasks and data, and data derived from um, machines and, and crowds. And um, we also did an experimental access project where we did more research into what types of metadata users are seeking when they're using library materials. And then also in our um, computing cultural heritage in the cloud project, we're working with, um, re we worked with three researchers who use various AI and ML methods to access and analyze our data in cloud environments. Um, so from, all, from these and other experiments, we've learned that there's a lot of promise to transform our services. And the user research is really showing that when AI or ML data is presented with context and provenance, the users are usually pretty happy to see it. And, um, and they find that enhanced data really useful. Um, and we're also seeing that these um, experience, experiments are revealing the need for um, expertise in these technologies in the organization, and also um, the need to engage across the curatorial, technical, and reference units um, to, uh, to sort of implement these and serve users. And um, that the AI and ML models um, need to be, uh, and the services need to be tailored for our historic and idiosyncratic documents. And um, that we have to have some shared quality and operational standards for implementing AI systems that reflect the, the sort of values and use cases of, of LAMS. So based on these kind of, um, the, this sort of first phase of work, we've come up with these recommendations. I can share this slide if anybody, these slides if people want. Um, but the, uh, uh, and then this is sort of pointing to the next step. So um, these, this is sort of, and you can see the specific in parentheses underneath the specific uh, experiment that um, sort of supports these recommendations. And these are all available. Um, sort of the reports, recommendations, and any code um, are all available from our website. Um, so these, uh, I'll get into sort of the, um, the specific things that we're working on kind of currently. Um, and that will be, um, and I'll talk specifically about the idea of um, sort of it, uh, working with senior le leaders and engaging senior leaders around these topics. So we, um, the last, uh, the last two weeks, the last two Fridays, the first two Fridays in May, so the last couple of weeks, we held a workshop with um, the uh, uh, NARA, National Archives and Records Administration, um, the Smithsonian and um, Virginia Tech. And this was following on a series of workshops that, that um, they held around um, uh, using AI and ML in public archives. So we, um, um, decide we really want to get together and, and um, write a statement of um, values together that we would sort of adhere to. Um, but we, we were sort of going back and forth about how to um, sort of get sign off from our from our higher ups to do this and uh, sort of get to get them engaged. So we devised this two day workshop, it was two hours each. And, um, and uh, the first day we focused on sort of basic awareness, literacies around the topic. And we really, and we broke out and on this left-hand side, there's this problem framing canvas. And we went through uh, this exercise with them, which um, was really sort of trying to uh, look at the sort of different problems that AI or ML could, could help with from their seats um, as, a, as a senior leader. And then in the second day, we focused on um, uh, risks and um, did an exercise around um, defining the challenge and then um, looking at the risks involved. Uh, the second day, we also looked at, um, uh, we had a speaker from NIST, which is the National Institute for Standards and Technology, which is a federal agency in the United States that um, is working on a trustworthy AI risk model, which is here, it's in draft form. Um, the link there is uh, for the full draft, but there's been, a number of policies and statements from different governing bodies around how to develop trustworthy AI systems, what that means, really detailed definitions and really detailed work um, that is speaking specifically it, it, and then sort of different profiles of how to, to, uh, to apply these, uh, this sort of risk model. And um, specifically in the financial sector, in the health sector, 
um, defining um, risks and then trying to uh, measure them, manage them and mitigate them. Uh, so this was something that uh, because managers are really used to um, talking about risk uh, and thinking about risk, uh, uh, th this was a really useful model to sort of get them engaged around the topic. So this is um, an assessment that we um, sort of developed based on that first sort of the first uh, um, phase of experiments of where we're thinking about a, uh, one of these use cases that came up. This is an exercise that we also did in the, in the workshop, thinking about the use case and then thinking about the different levels of risk and how risks could be different for users, different for staff. And if there's a, a sort of yellow, yellow, red, green way, which is another way sort of managers are used to um, uh, sort of thinking about risks to, uh, to and this did, um, uh, Garner some interesting conversations around, you know, sort of. We had our uh, a participant from the National Library for the Blind and Print Disabled, um, the director of that organization, talk about um, they're really interested in using um, AI and ML to to deliver their services better because their users are um, don't really aren't really served by anyone else. They're they're sort of. The, their only um, source for information or the biggest source of high quality information. So the risk of not doing, of not improving those services is, is, is sort of high. Um, and, um, but uh, on the other side, the, the risk for the organization, sort of people were talking about, um, you know, risk to reputation. What if we don't get it right? What if people are, uh, what if we publish something that um, is wrong um, or, so it was it was a good um, productive way to sort of talk about what we would you know what the risks are and then maybe what you could do uh, next. So another um, I talked about the organizational profile of um, for the NIST AI um, trustworthy framework uh, and in talking um, with her Ellen Tabasi is the person who we talked to who gave a presentation and she talked about building organizational profiles for uses of AL, AI and ML. And so we came up with this um, sort of start of, of thinking about what um, for LAMs, what a profile could be. And we were thinking about the top layer as um, a sort of uh, front of the house, um, sort of something that users would interact with or, 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 um, uh, or that is uh, interact with or see. So on the up left, the, um, you know, sort of, creating uh, metadata to enhance discovery, you know, like OCR, speech to text, named entity linking, um, and then it, it, thinking about other uses, so enabling research use, so having making data available so that users can um, use um, AI or ML techniques um, to analyze data. That's a kind of a slightly different use. And then also, um, the if going straight down from there, the augmenting user services, um, you know, creating chatbots, voice assistants. Thing, um, this is something our uh, our um, colleagues in the National Library for the Blind and Print Disabled are really interested in exploring, but sort of slightly different with maybe a slightly different sort of risk analysis um, and benefit analysis uh, there. And then the the sort of uh, bottom left quadrant. Um, is where I think there's a lot of um, prom there's there, there's a, a lot of promise here um, which we haven't really explored yet. So this is sort of back of the house, um, you know, business uh, uh, interacting with the sort of business needs and and, and um, IT infrastructure. What can AI and ML um, help with there? Um, so this is just sort of our first pass at at um, thinking about what an or a profile could be. So also um, inspired by, or sort of thinking of um, how digitization has, um, has evolved into sort of common practice uh, that um, AI and ML would need sort of similar kinds of documentation and standards of, of, of how um, data is processed and, and generated. So um, we created this data processing plan um, that we're that we're using. We, I don't have a public link for it yet, but um, we will hopefully in the next couple of weeks. But the um, but basically, it's a deliverable that we're having vendors if they're going to use any um, 
any uh, if they're going to take um, do any AI or ML processes on our data, then um, they'll have to fill this plan out at the beginning at the end. And the idea is that it would um, document, you know, sort of what the intent is, what the known, you know, what the, what, what what's known about the data, what you know, all the details about what the training data is, what the target data is. So sort of document all these things so that we sort of have it so we can learn from it when we're sort of building our, our systems in the future. And the idea is that this is again, the sort of a first, first draft that will refine this over time and that it will be sort of this or something else will be sort of in, in an ecosystem of other forms of documentation, just like in other sort of digital library uh, um, uh, practices, we, um, you know, we have a lot of different kinds of format documentation and, and uh, we kind of see the need for similar things here. And then to sort of to wrap it up, the, um, uh, the, we created a, a mechanism um, to do more experimentation around AI and ML. Um, it's an innovation and experimentation IDIQ, which is a contract mechanism that we use. It's called indefinite delivery, indefinite quantity. So basically it's a framework or sort of a need that we put out there that then um, that will be good for um, five years. And then we can put task orders against it for, sm for smaller projects or large projects, but they, there's um, these three performance areas and um, it's it sort of cod it, that experimentation model that I showed at the beginning. It's it's it uh, codifies that, and then also um, it includes the requirement for the data processing plan um, to do these, especially for pro, uh, a performance area area two for data transformation and generation. So that um, is what I was going to share today. Oh yeah, uh, and we're we're trying we're sort of thinking of. Um, bringing these uh, the, the the different things together, the um, the sort of risk assessment um, tool and the sort of organizational profile, this documentation and standards as sort of a body of of um, we're not quite sure what to do with it yet, but sort of a way to help us think about how to implement um, AI and ML in a more uh, um, uh, sort of at scale um, operational. Uh, basis at the at the library, which um, we we don't yet have the the sort of buy in around a, a, an overall um, AI strategy yet at the organization, but um, uh, we think that that's uh, kind of coming around the corner too. So hopefully th these things will. And we'd love to talk to you all about um, if these things make sense or how they could be you know uh, changed or added to in a collaborative way. Okay. All right. Thank you so much, uh, mm -hmm. Abigail. Um, questions? Please also feel free to post the questions on the note stock instead of the chat so we can all build like a knowledge base from all mm -hmm. the questions per presentation. Maybe a question, uh, Abby. Um, you mentioned so this documentation for for vendors. Uh, I think it's a yeah, it's a great idea, and we also had this comparison of what we learned with the digitization process. So mm -hmm. it inspires us in what we need to create for the for the vendors. Um, how mature would you say uh, vendors are with using AI technology in uh, in the US, or the, the types of vendor you're working with at least? Yeah, the um, the first time we put out a uh, a sort of a proposal, a call for proposals for uh, uh, a sort of AI ML um, project or experiment, it um, it that was I don't know, remind me, Megan. I don't know if you, it was that like 2018, and the the yeah. responses were kind of crazy. Um, they were very, very expensive large vendors. Yeah. yeah, very large vendors, you know, very, who like very, very expensive and, um, you know, trying to sort of sell the whole system of like, we'll just solve all your problems and um, with, uh, you know, and it'll, well, we can do it with 95% accuracy and all, like lots of big claims. Um, and we did not go with them, but um, it, 
but it's gotten better, but that's mainly because we were sort of priming the pump and sort of looking at what vendors have, were out, out there doing similar work and sort of approaching them um, and seeing if they would be interested in working with us. Um, so the um, we had to do a lot of market research as part of our um, acquisitions process to get this um, contract vehicle out, the IDIQ out. And I think we have, and uh, there's not very many of them. I think um, we're we've worked with uh, University of um, University of Nebraska Lincoln. Um, we've worked with uh, ABP, which is a vendor here in on the states. Uh, they used to be called AV Preservation, but now they just they do ABP. And then Digerati, which is a um, a UK firm. Um, and and then we've had interest from other folks. The um, so I think it's getting better. The, but it's sort of pretty targeted niche market um, right now. But I think where it's more, which I think would be interesting would be to figure out ways to do larger scale experiments with universities, which um, we don't really have that, that sort of, uh, we don't have those kind of partnership vehicles in place. Um, but that would be something that we'd be interested in, in uh, in pursuing because um, especially around the sort of skills and training sort of partnerships to do that and then also um, for uh, research projects you know for sort of things that are more you know four or five years out from being implemented. Any other questions for the video? Hi, um, this is Steve Meyer from University of Wisconsin-Madison in the States. Um, so just a follow-up to that comment about projects with universities. Were you, did you, were you thinking of, these are projects that are, involve participants that are from the university libraries or did you mean researchers at the university using the data? I think both. Um, I think our partnership, our, we, it, was an, it was a contract that we did with the University of Nebraska-Lincoln, and it was their um, Project Ada team, which include, which is sort of um, uh, the library and computer science group um, that is, was sort of preformed and worked on other grant-funded projects. But we worked with them, um, and that was, that was excellent because there was, you know, um, a lot of deep knowledge around the needs in libraries and and then also uh you know students who are learning um ai and ml computer science students um who wanted to work on sort of who got to work on sort of real world problems um which was uh you know they said beneficial for them thank you mm -hmm. thank you we have time for one more question. Megan Ferriter from LC Labs says that also in our Computing Cultural Heritage in the Cloud project, we have worked with faculty computational researchers, but we see the need to connect with the university libraries and other staff. That was more of our comment, right? I was just following up on the end of what Abby mentioned with, we um, have contracted with um, computational researchers. So it, it appeared like a grant program, but it's actually a, a contract in the same sort of way. And we um, worked ex explicitly with the researchers, but we saw that in the future, we would want to also establish relationships with the libraries that support them or, or partner with them. On their I think you muted yourself, Megan. Oh, I'm sorry. We didn't catch the last sentence, I feel. I just was mentioning that in the future, um, as we were, would potentially build out other contracts with researchers, that we would try to also establish communication with those, the libraries or other forms of digital scholarship support that are 
uh, working with those researchers in their home institutions. Okay, thank you so much. It's time to wrap up. So if you have more questions, please uh, paste them into the notes document. Um, the speakers uh, will try to respond to them. So that was all for today. I hope to see you all in the, in the next community call. All right, thank you so much. Bye. Bye. Bye.